Father, I think there's a lot of things that you're worthy of praise and worthy of worship for, Lord. And there's so many things that we're not worthy of anything for, but you do it anyway. And so we just want to thank you and honor you tonight, Lord. And I just pray that it's not just combined nights or not just radiate or camp or church on Sunday when we get to sing those praises, Jesus, but it's every day and every moment and every breath that we take. It's what we truly mean. It's our actual heart cry is a hallelujah in a worship because that's all we have. Nothing else is good enough for you, Lord. And so we worship you. We ask that you're with us tonight as we hop into your word, Lord, be with me um, and just guide me tonight, Lord. In your name, I pray. Amen. 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 Everybody take a seat. Hello. Hi, everybody. If you've not met me before, my name is Mia. I don't get to do this a lot, and I am so excited to be here with you guys tonight. Um, I am the Radiate Youth Coordinator, so I get to do all the fun stuff, but I also get to do awesome things just like this and preach on combined nights. And this is my first combined night ever preaching, so I am super excited to be here as we're talking about changing our lives, right? We're talking about those moments where you may feel a little distant from God or you don't really know where God is in your situation, but God is there and he's always been there and he's super excited to be close to you, but there are things that we can do. Like week one, Jake talked all about beholding and being transformed, that we get to behold God and see God in a new way every, every time we sit down to do our quiet time or whenever we worship, we get to behold and be transformed and watch God change our lives. And the next week, I literally was like crying, boohooing in the back because he was talking about renewing our mind, that we have the ability to take these negative thoughts we have in our brain and to make them obedient to scripture and that is the truth that we live in. That is what we believe. That's how we're going to transform our minds is by renewing them and making them obedient to scripture. But I, this week, get to talk about prayer. And I was so excited when Jake was like, you literally can, whatever you want to talk about, what really changed your life. And I was really thinking, like, what discipline, what happened as I was pursuing Jesus that really changed my life? And it was prayer. It was a time. I'm going to talk to you guys even more about it later, but it was a time in my life where I was just coming back to church. Like, I knew Jesus, grew up in a Christian home, but I was just coming back to church for, like, the first time in a while, and I was trying to do the Christian thing. Like, I was trying to do all the right things. I was trying to keep coming on Sundays, trying to keep going to Fuse, but it was hard. I didn't really want to go to small group. I had other friends, and it was just making doing the Christian thing hard. And I remember sitting at my desk and asking God, you know, God, like, I really want to be close to you, but it's feeling really impossible. Or every time I feel like I'm inching a little closer to where you are, I feel like I'm taking three steps back, or you're taking a bunch of steps away, and I don't know what to do. And I did something super bold and super scary, but I told God to do whatever he wanted to, whatever he needed to do so that me and him were going to be close, so that I would always feel that way that I felt the first time I ever met him, he could do. No matter what it was, he could just do whatever. And in the following months, he did do whatever, and it wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be, but I really don't think I'd be here or even a Christian if it wasn't for that prayer, if it wasn't for sitting down and being honest with God and asking him to do something I wasn't thinking that I was ready for. But that kind of brings me to my bottom line. You know, the biggest thing that I want you guys to take home, if you're not going to take home anything at all, is that believers who are chasing God's will for their lives pray bold prayers. Believers who are chasing God's will for their lives pray bold prayers. If you're wondering how to live this godly life, or if you're wondering how to have those moments with God over and over again, Jesus shows us that it's through bold prayer. It's through honest and scary prayer. No matter what the outcome is, no matter what God's action will be after your prayer, that's how we're going to do it, through these bold prayers. And I was, you know, flipping through my Bible, trying to figure out, like, how I was going to show you guys this. And God was like, literally, I taught you how to pray. So we're going to go through the Lord's Prayer. Does anybody know the Lord's Prayer? Probably, like, back and forth. Yeah. Some people, like, you say, our Father who art in heaven. Yeah. 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 We're starting to get it now. 
I called my grandma and I asked her, I was like, yo, Nana, when was the first time I ever like fully said the Lord's prayer? Like how old was I? And I was three years old. Like most, three, like you can't, can barely even use the bathroom. At, you can barely even like go to the bathroom by yourself when you're three. Some three-year-olds are literally still in diapers. But I literally was like full out saying like the King James version type beat of the Lord's prayer. And so I was like really reading this prayer. And as I was reading it, I was like, oh my goodness, like, we're saying some things that, like, if you don't mean this, if you don't really want to tell God to do these things in your life, you shouldn't be saying it. We shouldn't be uttering these words out of our mouths if this isn't what we genuinely believe. And so Jesus tells us that this is how we're literally to pray as believers, and we're going to go through the entire thing, and I'm super excited, so strap in. But if you want to know where we're going to be, we're going to be in Matthew 6. I'm going to kind of camp out in Matthew. That's where we're going to be tonight. And so uh, Jesus is doing this thing called the Sermon on the Mount, right? He's preaching to all these people from this mountain. And so some people say it's a lot of people. Some people say it's just the disciples, but that's neither here nor there. So the disciples are sitting on a mountain with Jesus. And I can just imagine they're all talking to Jesus. And he's like, you know, let's talk about prayer. Let's talk about the way that you guys are meant to pray. Like, Jesus just spent 40 days in the wilderness with his father, so he's obviously going to know how to pray. I'm going to be honest. When I preach a lot, I get very dry throat, so if somebody wants to bring me water, that'll be absolutely phenomenal before we um, hop in. But, yeah, I see people moving. That's awesome. Thanks, you guys. I appreciate that. Um, anyway, so we get to see the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is telling these people exactly how to pray. And so let's hop in to the beginning. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father who art in heaven. Everybody thank Pastor Macy for keeping me hydrated. Appreciate her. I'm just going to open this for a minute. Yeah. It's great. Thank you guys. Thank you. Everybody up here is telling me I'm doing great. So. Wow. 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 Thanks, Tanner. Um, okay, cool. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And so let's kind of break it up because it's going to bring up a couple of really big words, right? These R's and arts and fathers and hallows. And so our Father who is in heaven. I had to break this up and start thinking about my own dad. My dad, his name is Dominic. I literally am so close to my dad. Like, I'm the only girl. So me and my dad are like absolute homies. Like, we both love Marvel movies. We both love action stuff. We both are big, like, sweet treats people. Like, we're homies. Like, that's my best friend, to be honest with you. And me and my dad are super close. He probably knows me the best. And out of all of his kids, I definitely know him the best. Like, when it comes to, like, Dominic Pickett trivia, I got it, for real. Like, every single year. And so, me and my dad are close. I'm familiar with him. He knows me, and I know him, and I trust him. And our father is the same way. You have a God that is close to you. And that is familiar with you. You can know him and you can trust him. There's a familiarity there. You're super close with your God. And then hallowed be your name. Hallowed really just means this word holy, right? So holy, we've kind of talked about it, means set apart. So God is close but set apart. He's close but different. Our God is different than you and me because you and I are flawed, right? We have sin. That's what makes us different from God, but he's set apart from that. Our God is holy. Our God is perfect. Our God is good. Our God is different. And so that means that we are praying to a God that is close but holy, a God that is familiar but weighty. And so what does that mean? It means that we get to talk to God because we have an intimate relationship with him. As believers, you and I get to go to God and ask God things because we have an intimate relationship with him. It's, it's like, I, I don't like talking to strangers. If you were on the mission trip last year, you know I do not like talking to strangers, okay? I get all sweaty, and I get all clammy, and I don't know what to do, and I just, I can't do it. I freak out. But if you ask me to ask a stranger to fix my car or to ask my dad to fix my car, I'm going my dad 100% because I trust my dad. And I have a relationship with my dad. And I know my dad wouldn't say no, and I know my dad would do a good job. 
That is the same exact reason that you and I get to go to God. Because we have a relationship with our God, and we trust our God, and we know our God, and our God is not going to say no when it comes to our good. So that's what it means. Before we even hop in, we get to see our Father is in heaven. He is close but holy, because hallowed, hallowed is his name. And then hopping into my first point, we're going to go to verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Believers who are chasing God's will for their life will pray bold prayers. And the bold prayer that they will pray is that the Lord's will be done. What God is trying to say here is that you and I are built for like this kingdom mindset, right? Our prayers aren't just about what we want. Our prayers aren't just about God. Like, I really want to get into my college, this college because I know I can do good things. Or God, I really want to make this sports team. I really want these friends. I really want my life to look like this. That's not what your prayers are about. Your prayers are about this kingdom mindset, looking above and beyond and seeing what the Lord's will is for your life instead of our will. So what is this idea of will? What is will? Basically, will is what we want. These needs that we have, right? These things that we want for our lives, these plans that we all have for our lives. I'm a control freak, so I have like a distinct plan for like here. I call it my six-year plan, right? Like I have a plan from now to six years ahead of me. But what God is telling us here is that to pray that his kingdom come and his will be done means that I take up that plan and I give it to him and I submit it to him and I say, God, if this is your will, then yes. But if not, I'm going to take up your will instead. If this is your plan for my life, then I want to take up that plan for my life instead. I trust you and give you full rule and full reign to do what you want to do with my life and have your way with my will. And I know that's not an easy thing to do from a fellow control freak, but you can see how God will change your life when he does it, when you lay down and surrender your will. Um, I used to go to a summer camp every single summer, like a sleepaway summer camp. So it wasn't just a week. It was like from June to like August-ish, right? I'd be gone at the summer camp all summer long. And I remember one of the best things about it was we had this thing called a yes day. Okay, so we would wake up and like our counselors would be like, yo, it's yes day, it's the best day in the world. And we'd be like, okay, whatever, I don't know what yes day is. But the whole point of yes day is that there's no such thing as no. Like whoever asks you to do something, your counselor asks you to do something, the camp director asks you to do something, it's all yeses, okay? So middle schoolers, we're leaving on Wednesday, are you guys excited? Yeah. Oh, they're excited, okay. So imagine it's, you know, Friday, We've been at camp for two days. We're having fun. And Jake wakes us all up and goes, today is yes day, y'all. Everything I say, all yeses, no nos. He's like, Sebastian, I need a fort. Go get me a fort. Or he's like, Natalie, I need you to go and pie me a, I just, I need you to do that for me. Or he looks at, who else is uh, going? He goes, looks at Sarah Hanson. He goes, you know what? I need Sarah, I need you to um, throw a balloon, a water balloon at Holly. Like that's the kind of things yes day would entail. And I remember being like a little baby beaver camper and being like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, it's my first yes day and I'm so scared. And everybody's always talked about yes day and how crazy things happen. And I was talking to one of the other girls and I was like, well, like, how do I know I'm not going to get hurt on yes day? Like, people got to do all these crazy things. How do I know that I'm not going to get hurt? And she said, because you know our counselor. You know our counselor, you've been with her for a couple of weeks and you know that she's never going to do anything to hurt you. Like, she loves you, and yesterday is all about having fun, and she's not going to do anything that's not for your good. Like, everything that we're going to do is good. And in that moment, I was like, yeah, you're right. I do know my counselor, and I do trust her, and she is good, so I guess it's okay if she tells me to do what I should do. And in the same way, you and I have a counselor who is good, who you can trust, who you can give full surrender and full reign over to and just trust that whatever he's going to say is going to be good and it's going to be for your good. I mean, even in Romans 8, 28, and you guys can write that down if you want to, but he says, and know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. God works for the good of those 
who love him. So if you're surrendering your will to God, you're not going to pick up a will that's going to harm you or that's going to hurt you. You're going to pick up a good will that is for your good purpose and for his glory. And that is how his kingdom comes from heaven to earth. When we give God full reign and full surrender of our will and take up what God has for our lives. But in that, we have to be able and ready and willing to surrender. Like, are we actually able, ready, and willing to surrender? Are you willing to God give God full, like, reign over your influence at school? Over the friends that you have, maybe the popularity status you have? Are you giving God full reign to say, like, oh, you're not going to go to that college, but you're going to go to this college, and you're going to spread the gospel instead? Are we willing to give God full reign of that? And I think a lot of times we don't actually pray this prayer in our own quiet times because we're not ready to submit that will to God. We're not ready to submit the things that we want to do, our free will. We're not ready to submit that to God because we just want to do what we want. But when we take up his will, we know and we have a promise that we have a God that's going to work for our good during this will. And so just if you have your uh, Bibles or your notebooks out, I really want you guys to write down when was the last time you did something you didn't want to do because it's God will, God's will? When was the last time you did something that you did not want to do because it was God's will, because it was going to give God glory? Okay, verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Pause, we're going to pause there. And this isn't a really big point, but I was super confused when I was first reading this, I was like, give us this day, this day, our daily bread. Why did Jesus ask for that? Like, Jesus was growing up in a time where, like, there weren't Chick-fil-A's, there were no Taco Bells, you couldn't just roll through a cookout, okay? Like, finding daily bread was difficult. So I was like, what? Like, why would he just say enough bread for today? Like, Jesus knows good and well he could have asked God for daily bread for the next three weeks. He could have asked God for daily bread for the next week. He could have asked God for Jerusalem's 11s, right? He could have asked God for the coolest new shoe, and he would have done it. So why did he just ask him for daily bread? And I was listening to a pastor. His name is Francis Chan. And he was talking about how God, or how Jesus was talking and asking God to fill him up with his word. He was asking him to fill him up with this. And I was like, that doesn't make sense. Like, why would he just, again, why would he just want to be filled up with enough of Jesus for today? That doesn't make sense. Why don't he say, fill me up for the whole year. Fill me up for the rest of my life. And one of the coolest things that he said was, if Jesus would have asked to continuously be filled, just, you know, over and over and over again, he would have never wanted to come back. He would have never wanted to sit back at his Bible and be filled. It's like, you have to be hungry to be able to eat again. You have to be hungry to want the next meal. And that's what Jesus is saying here is, that he wants God to just give him enough for today. And it made me think, when was the last time I asked God, you know, just fill me up for today so that tomorrow I'm hungry and I need you again. Let me read my Bible and fill me up with your Holy Spirit just enough for today so that tomorrow I'm hungry and I need your spirit all over again. And that's just a little side note, but ain't that a kick in the butt to read your Bible? Verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Or some verses say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I hear somebody singing out, saying it out there. Okay. Basically, believers who are chasing God's will for their lives pray that they're forgiven as much as they forgive others. We pray that we are forgiven as much as we forgive others. Right there, what Jesus is saying is that you and I, in this prayer, are just asking God to forgive us as much as we forgive those who hurt us. And I know every time we hear a forgiveness sermon, you think of one person. There's one person or maybe two people in your mind right now who have hurt you, who made you feel little, who made you feel less than, and I'm so sorry they made you feel that way. But what God is calling you to is a standard of forgiveness and mercy that he had. 
a compassion that he had, a grace that he had towards us. It is way, way, way greater. That's why these prayers are scary. It's because if we don't have that kind of forgiveness for people, then what does that mean for us? If we don't have that sort of forgiveness in our hearts for the people who have hurt us, what does that mean for us? It means that we aren't forgiven. And we get to see this really uh, plainly in one of, and further on, in one of the parables that Jesus has. And so Jesus tells these stories, and they're called parables, and he talks about this unforgiving servant. This servant who was forgiven of his trespasses, forgiven of his debt, but didn't forgive his fellow servants. So I'm going to kind of speed through it. We won't read the whole thing. But imagine, you know, Jesus and his homies, the disciples are kind of just chilling out. You guys know Peter. Peter always puts his foot in his mouth. So just imagine yourself. You're sitting there, and you just see Peter's hand shoot up. Jesus, I have a question. I have a big question, Jesus, for you, and I need you to answer it. How many times am I meant to forgive somebody? And Jesus kind of looks and he goes, what? Like, how many times am I meant to forgive somebody, Jesus? Like, seven times? I only forgive somebody seven times. And then after the seventh time, I don't have to forgive them and everything's fine. And Jesus just looks at Peter and he goes, no, not just seven times, Peter. Seventy times, seven times. And I assume all Peter and the rest of the disciples kind of just looked at him like, what is this guy talking about? And he goes into this story. And so let's just say we have master. We have the master. We have servant A and servant B. And servant A owed the master, well, we'll say it's, they say 10,000 talents. And so we'll just say $10,000. That's what the master was owed to the, the servant A. Servant A had to pay the master that. But he says, I can't pay that. Like, I can't afford to pay that. And the master was so gracious with him and decided, you know what? I'm going to have pity on you. And your debt is forgiven. You have no, no more debt. Your debt is gone. And so servant A goes back to where the, servants, the rest of the servants are and sees servant B. And he goes, hey, 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 I um, actually uh, don't have the money for you, servant A, but I'll have it soon. And he only owes him. 10 denarii. So let's assume $10, right? Like a much, much, much smaller debt. And so he kind of looks at him and he goes, "Um, you owe me my money. I need it back. And servant A has servant B thrown in jail. But y'all, when the master hears about this, he's furious. He's so angry. He's like, I told you, I, I gave you compassion. I had pity on you and you couldn't even have that for your fellow servant. You had grace and forgiveness extended to you and mercy, but you couldn't have that for the person that you live right next to. And it says he had them thrown to the torturers. He had him thrown in worse than just prison because he was extended grace and he couldn't give that out to others. And then verse 18, or, or in Matthew 18, verse 35, and I suggest you guys all go back and read this because it's just so good. He says, so my heavenly father also will do to each of you from his heart who does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Right there, we see God value the forgiveness that he gave us and see how God's saying, hey, I forgave you. I had pity on you. I had compassion towards you because I love you. And now I want you to go and extend that to the people around you who have hurt you. But if you can't do that, then I can't forgive you. And I think that that's a really hard truth for a lot of us to hear. Because if we're praying that prayer and we believe that that prayer is true, then we're kind of in a tough spot because there are some people that we have not forgiven yet. So if Jesus forgave you, Based on how you've forgiven others, where do you lie with him? Where do you lie with him and who do you need to forgive? What friend do you need to send a text to today? My last point, uh, verse 13, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Oh, come on, Cody, I heard you. Anyway, 
Um, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Believers who are chasing God's will for their life pray to be delivered. And y'all, I'm super excited about this one. Like I'm about to start pacing around because I'm just so excited because we have the ability to be delivered from our sins. And so let me explain temptation. Let me explain this word temptation. What that is, is it's those little thoughts you get in your brain right before you sin. When you maybe know you're not supposed to go to the mall because you told your mom you weren't going to go, but you're like, well, she's not going to find out if I just like turn off my find my friends, and lo- turn off my location app. She ne- Ooh, I got somebody there. Turn off my location app. She's never going to find out. Or you are like, well, maybe I can just tell this one lie to my dad and it's going to be okay if I just tell this one lie to my dad. He's never going to find out. Or I can just watch this thing I know I'm not supposed to watch one time. Text this friend I know I'm not supposed to text one time. Go over to this place I know I'm not supposed to be at one time. It's those thoughts. But the truth is that Jesus can free you from that. And when you have those thoughts, that's where it stops before it develops into full-blown sin. And to me, that's one of the boldest parts of this prayer, that we're asking God to deliver us from the things that, honestly, we like. Why else would we sin against God and sin against his creation if it wasn't, like, momentary satisfaction? If it didn't feel good for that moment, if we didn't get what we wanted for that moment, why else would we sin against God? Just to disobey him? No, we do it because it feels good. That's why we do it. We do it because we get what we want. In, in praying this prayer, we have to ask God to take the secret things from us, our back pocket sins that nobody knows. We have to ask God to take away the things that we genuinely enjoy to do. We have to ask God to deliver us from gossip and disrespecting our parents from lying and bullying and how does he do that? How does God deliver us from these things? This is honestly part of the end of my story with walking through this. I remember praying that prayer and asking God, just like, take the things that I'm doing away from me. Like, take these things away from me, God. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to be close to you. And when I said that, he was listening real good that day because he did it. In the next six months, lost a relationship. I lost a lot of friends. I wasn't really active in my sorority anymore. I mean, honestly, you guys, COVID happened. And I'm not wishing that on any of us, but what did I do the entire time of COVID? I spent the entire next six months at my desk reading my Bible and talking to Jesus. I spent the rest of that time with Jesus. And in that moment, I didn't recognize all the things that I was asking him to do, but what I was asking him to do was take away the friends that didn't care about Jesus. I was asking him to take temptation out of my life. I was asking him to convict me and catch me up in my sin because that is exactly what he did. And when he did that, I saw Jesus in a brand new way. I mean, it was a bold prayer and it was a scary prayer, but it was super, super important that I prayed that prayer. And so if this is a prayer that you're needing to start pray in your life, if you have sin that you're ready to be delivered from, you're asking Jesus to take away from you, you have to pray this prayer. He's going to do it. And he's going to do it to the best of his ability, but you have to be ready and you have to expect God to convict you of some sin. You have to expect maybe your mom to go through your browser history or a friend to find out you did something that you weren't supposed to do. You have to be ready for that, but that is where God is going to work in your life. And so, in the Lord's Prayer, in this entire thing, we watch as God can transform our lives just by saying a couple of things to him. In the weight of our prayer, our prayer carries weight, y'all. And so, if you're a believer who is chasing God's will for their life, maybe the prayer that you need to pray is that his will be done in your life. That it's not about your will anymore. That no longer are you wanting to just do whatever you want, but you're ready to surrender your will and say, God, I want to do what you want to do. Have your way, God. Do that. Maybe that's where you're at. Or maybe 
there's somebody that you need to forgive. Maybe as we go <clears throat> into a time of response, there's a friend that you need to text. Or there's a friend you need to walk up to and say, I, I love you and I forgive you because Jesus has forgiven me. Because I've been forgiven so much, I forgive you even more. Or maybe for you, there's a secret sin that you have that it's time to be delivered from. There's a secret sin that you have that lives in the back pocket that you don't want your parents to know about, you don't want your friends to know about, you don't want to talk to anybody about. But you know what you can do? You can go to the altar and leave it there. And you can give it to God and say, God, free me from this. As I step into this temptation, God, just free me from my sin. Deliver me from the evil one because you're the only one that can do it. Because we have a God with this power to be able to do it. And so as we kind of go back into a time of response, I really want you guys to focus in on that. Like, like actually put your phones down and watch as Jesus does things in your life. Watch as Jesus changes things through the power of the prayers that we have. Let's pray. Um, Jesus, I think that there are so many things that we can thank you and worship you for, but man, as I look at this prayer, I just think about the weight, the weight of who you are and what you can do in our lives, God. That you are our Father who is close but holy, who is familiar but carries such weight, and that even as we pray now, there are things that you're wanting to do and you're stirring up, God. I just pray that forgiveness comes as easy for us as it did for you that day on the cross. God, I pray that deliverance comes from us only from you, and so we're ready to lay that down at the altar. God, I pray that we're ready to surrender our will. We're ready to surrender our wants to you, Jesus, once and for all. And so we just ask as we respond that you join us in this moment and take up the wills, take up the sin, and recognize our forgiveness. In your name, I pray. Amen. Hey, let's stand up and let's respond in worship. Do you? 